Would you turn to the first epistle penned by the Apostle John, chapter 1. 1 John, chapter 1. We'll begin with verse 6. We'll soon be coming to the close of this promise series. And my goal and intention was that we might have our faith totally built by knowing God has promised some things that He's going to fulfill for His people. A promise of God is what He has declared He will do for His people. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. Would you stand for the reading of the Word? Now, I, I want to note with the second word that we're talking to Christians here. I'm not saying that none of this applies to unbelievers, but John was addressing Christians. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we make a mistake. We didn't quite get it right. Is that how John said it? He said, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. I don't need to really preach. We can just shout from there. Hallelujah. Verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His Word is not in us. Verse 7 says, The blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. I want to preach this morning on the promise of the blood cleansing. Hallelujah. The promise of the blood cleansing. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your pronounced presence in this place. Lord, move beyond even this house. Any that's listening this morning, Lord, minister to them. Save and heal. Encourage and strengthen. Lord, we need You to preach this morning. We need Your anointing, Your touch, Your help. In Jesus' name, you can be seated. I want to make clear at the onset of this message that it's not just the unsaved and the unconverted that need the blood of Jesus. They do. But it's also the saved that need the blood of Jesus. It's the converted that needs the blood of Jesus. I need the blood of Jesus. You need the blood of Jesus. John was writing to the Christians. He says, we need this cleansing of this blood. I have found in the church realm, in relationship to the blood of Jesus, folks fall into error by one or two things. The first is that some folks begin to presume upon the blood of Jesus. I'll do wrong and the cleansing's always there, so go ahead and do wrong. They presume upon the blood of Jesus. But there's another class of folks that even though they have been initially saved, they live without the assurance of the blood. You see, the blood isn't just for a one-time cleansing. We have folks that have been saved and born again and accepted Christ in their life. But they begin to think, what if I'm not all right? What if there's some sin in my life? What if there's something there I just don't know about? And so they live without an assurance in the blood of Jesus. I'm preaching this morning because we must never presume upon the blood of Jesus. But on the other hand, we should live with the assurance of its continual cleansing of our lives and our hearts. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. I, I know I probably told it many times before. It had such an impact on me. But I was reading one time about the Canon Holmes, not our brother Holmes, another missionary. A missionary to India. 
And in one of the meetings there happened to be there a man possessed with demons. And as Canon Holmes began to pray for that man and seek God's deliverance, the demon spoke out of that man and said, The blood of Jesus is all dried up. Amen. The demons would like to believe that. That the blood of Jesus is all dried up. But I want to tell you this morning, without equivocation, the blood of Jesus is not dried up. It still flows from the rugged cross. And this morning it can cleanse the vilest sin. This I know. Yes, I know. Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner clean. Why? His blood still flows. Can you just worship Him for it? this morning. Hallelujah! (laughs) When we say that, we're not talking about the literal, physical properties of His human blood. But we are talking about that everything that blood accomplished on the cross, the results of that blood, the achievements of that blood, the effects of that blood, Jesus shed blood has reached all the way from the cross 2,000 years ago to this sanctuary and these souls this morning. It has spanned the gap of time and this morning the effects and the power of the blood is as real today as it was when Jesus shed it. Hallelujah. Are you thankful for the blood? I want to tell you one more time what His blood was doing on the day He was hanging for the, from the cross. His blood is doing that right now today in 2013. That's why you don't have to leave here unconverted, unsaved, with the burden and guilt of sin. You can leave here washed and forgiven and cleansed with eternal life. We've got the promise of the blood cleansing. Hallelujah. I want to talk first about the promise of the continual, continual cleansing. Verse 7, look at just at the remaining part of that verse. And it says, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now before I get any further, In a little bit, he's going to talk about forgiveness of sin too. But I want to make something clear here. His blood does more than forgive us of our sin. His blood cleanseth us from sin. What's the difference? Forgiveness is you've sinned, you've blown it, but since you've asked for me, I'm going to forgive you. But cleansing is the removal. Oh, we ought to shout. I said, he's done more than forgive us. He has cleansed us. Cleansing removes the sin. The prophet saw it or the psalmist saw it before his time. And he said, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Did you get it? He removed. He didn't just forgive our transgressions. He removed them from our heart. He removed them from our life. He removed them from our record. He removed them from our eternity. He removed the sin. He removed the guilt. He removed the condemnation. He removed the penalty. Aren't you glad for a cleansing? Hallelujah. Wouldn't you like to lift your hand and say, I've been cleansed. I know I've been forgiven. Thank God. But I've been cleansed by the blood. You see, in this promise of continual cleansing, we have to realize there's a real assurance here. I want to talk to you a little bit. We are Arminian, and I'm not going to get into the theology of that, but that just means that we believe as long as we want to stay in God's hand, He's going to keep us. He'll never get rid of us. But we can choose to walk away from God. And by either by default, or by my faulty understanding, or by exact teaching, I grew up as a child and a teenager with this lack of assurance. I begin to think that there could be some sin in my life I didn't even know about. Listen to me. In fact, I don't know if they taught me to pray this or I just picked it up. I would get down and pray, Lord, forgive me of my unknown sins. I don't even know about it. Forgive me. of. Now, that's not a bad prayer. But my conclusion from it was bad. 
You see, my conclusion was that I could commit a sin and not even know it. But if I was killed or Jesus came, I'd miss heaven and go to hell. Because there was sin in my life that I, I didn't know about it. You know, that, that, that has ramifications. What if even you sinned? And it was in a split second after that sin. You said, oh, I didn't want to do that. I can't believe I did that. And your conscience smites you. And the Holy Spirit deals with you and says, that's wrong, that's sin. But right before the moment, I'm talking about as a Christian, right before the moment, you said, yes, that's right, I've sinned. Right before you could think it or speak the words, oh, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus comes or you're killed in a car wreck with sin in your life. Did that mean you went to hell and missed heaven? And I lived with that lack of assurance. I'm not talking about calculated sin. I'm not talking about living with sin in our life and, and, and knowing about it and God dealing with us and we being stubborn about it. I'm talking about as a believer, unknown sins or sins we've not yet had the opportunity to ask His forgiveness. And I live with this lack of assurance. And I know there are others. It bothered them. What, what's going to happen? Maybe Maybe I never know that that sin could be there. It's going to send me to hell. And here, here I'm trying to do everything right. But if I die or the rapture takes place, I, I, I'm stuck in hell. What an awful lack of assurance. But then one day I got to reading. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth. I know it's old English, but what does the TH mean? <laughs> cleanseth. <laughs> And I got to reading as I was studying Greek at the time. I got to reading the Greek there and began to study it. And the Apostle John purposely chose a tense of the verb that doesn't mean cleanses, but it means a progressive, continuous, repetitive thing or action. In other words, when it says the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son cleanses us from all sin, that this doesn't mean on the day we got born again on the day we got saved and He washed away our past. That means every day since continually and repetitively and progressively the blood has been cleansing my saved soul. The blood has been cleansing my born again soul. It's a continual stream that flows. There's assurance in that. An unknown sin, His blood is cleansing it. A sin I've not yet been unaware of and repent of his blood is cleansing that. I'm telling you, aren't you glad for the promise of the continual cleansing? The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. I got to thinking of when Solomon dedicated the temple. The Bible says, and there's a verse, maybe I included, that King Solomon offered the sacrifice of 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep on the day of the dedication of that temple. Any way you figure that, that's a whole lot of blood. A whole lot. 22,000 oxen. 120,000. I'm telling you, that blood ran down the sides of that altar collected in a pool around the altar, ran off over the ground in rivers of blood. But ultimately, that blood somewhere soaked into the soil and dried up with the dust. All those animals and all that blood. And the message is, all of that blood couldn't remove even the smallest sin. It could not even take away the smallest of sins. It just satisfied for the moment and put the sins off to be dealt with at a later time. All that blood, that's a lot of blood. But brother, brother Rose, long time ago, not long after that day, every bit of that blood was dried up and it's none avail. Oh, but I want to talk about not 20 or 120,000 sheep. I want to talk about one lamb who shed his blood. And first of all, he just one drop of his blood can take away 
all sin. But more than that, His blood has not dried up in the ground around the cross. No, sir, His blood is flowing today. 2,000 years ago, that Lamb shed His blood. It ran down the cross. It pulled in and around the cross. But it began to run to every house, every church, every city, every village where they preach the Gospel of the risen Lord. And somebody said, I believe that. The blood went right to them and cleansed their heart. But that blood continued to flow. It flowed through the centuries. It flowed through time. It flowed to every nationality. It flowed to every ethnic group. It flowed to every educational background. It flowed to every environment. It flowed to the four corners of this earth. And everywhere, people cried out unto the Lord. That blood came and it cleanses them. Brother Wilson, that blood was flowing a long time before I was born. But in 1967, that blood flowed on a five-year-old heart and cleansed my heart. But it wasn't just that day. i like to tell you that these 40-something years later, that blood this morning all the way from the cross is cleansing my soul, cleansing my heart, cleansing my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Won't you love Him? Hallelujah. I want to preach this morning. We are never without the need of the blood cleansing. I don't care how long you serve God. Never are you without the need of the blood cleansing. And that's why I can say there's great assurance to know that His blood cleanseth continually. Oh, hallelujah. Sometimes you just got to get happy over the th- cleanseth. Hallelujah. How many glad for the continual cleansing? Our choir used to sing, covered. I'm covered by the blood. But I'm telling you, the blood hasn't just been applied and that's it. The blood is a continual flowing stream. Moment by moment, day by day, the blood is cleansing us even when we're not aware of it. What are you trying to say, Pastor? When I'm asleep, His blood is cleansing When I wake up, His blood is cleansing. When you go to work, the blood is cleansing. When you go to school, young people, the blood is cleansing. Hallelujah. It's a continual, it's a constant thing. Amen. Hallelujah. When I face the fight with Satan, His blood is cleansing. When I walk through the trial, His blood is cleansing. When I face the temptation, His blood is cleansing. I believe we ought to have the assurance of the blood. The blood is forever the reminder. He paid for sin. Sin. He ransomed us from sin. He's taken care of sin. And He is right now removing sin. Hallelujah. But you see, there's a condition of this continual cleansing. Look at the first part of verse 7. Here's the condition. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. That's a condition. One of the tragedies of modern Christianity is they want to quote and believe the promises of God without considering the conditions of those promises. Thank God for His continual cleansing, but it's contingent upon our walking in the light. You see, John says here, it's not just to say that one day we saw the light. It's not even enough to say we have come to the light or know the light. John says as believers, we should be walking in the light. You know, I I tire of of, of preaching things like it's something people have to do. Come on, if you're going to be a Christian, you need to walk in the light. Like, walking in darkness is fun? But now that you're a Christian, you've got to walk in light? Isn't it wonderful that we can walk in light? We haven't just seen the light. We're walking in the light. 
What does it mean to walk in the light? It means to walk in the light of the knowledge of the Lord and the revelation of His Word to our lives. To walk in the light is to walk in that which has changed us and made us different. To walk in the light is to live in such a way that it reveals the light has been shined in our hearts. That's walking in the light. What's walking in the light? It's seeking to follow God in all of His revealed Word to us. Now here's what John says. If we walk in the light, His blood will continually flow over our hearts. Hallelujah. In other words, to live walking in the light is to live with the continual flow of the blood of Jesus on our hearts. Listen, I want to get it straight here. The blood only flows in the light. I said the blood only flows in the light. The blood does not flow in darkness. Now here, I've got to qualify that. I'm talking about we believers claiming this promise. Because in a sense, the blood does flow in the dark. You let some sinner in the darkest place of sin and the darkest habitation of sin with the darkest heart and the darkest past. You let them call on the name of the Lord and the blood of Jesus will flow all the way into the darkness and cleanse their minds and heart and bring them into the light. But I'm talking about for the believer. The blood only flows in the light. The blood does not flow in the darkness. Hallelujah. But if you're a believer walking in the light, you can have the assurance that right here, right now, tomorrow morning, next week, if you're walking in the light, the blood is cleansing and flowing on your heart. In fact, John says, if one walks in darkness, it doesn't matter what he claims. He's not in fellowship with God. This then is the message, John said, which we have heard of Him and declared unto you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. It just doesn't happen. If you're in darkness, you can say you serve God, you love God, you follow God, you know God, you have fellowship with God. But if you're walking in the darkness of this world, John said, you're lying. You're lying. There's a lot of folks here. I'm not trying to be harsh or mean, but I'm telling you, there's a lot of people. Amen. I've been exposed to them, so have you. They claim to be a believer. They claim to be a Christian. They claim to have seen the light, but they walk in darkness. They walk in the same places of the world. They think the same thoughts, do the same deeds. They're walking in darkness. John said they're lying. They've never been converted. They've never come to the light. And that's a message in itself. Amen. But John said, on the other hand, if you're truly one that's walking in the light, we have fellowship one with another. That means between us and God and between the us, among us, the rest of us that are walking with God in the light. We have fellowship one with another if we walk in the and the blood of Jesus Jesus Christ, His Son, is constantly, continually, repetitively washing our souls. Oh, what an assurance. I'm blood washed, not just on the day I got saved, but I've been blood washed this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But then, there's an omission we need to make if we have the continual cleansing. We need to omit something. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, you've got to be careful here. John's not saying if we say we're not harboring known sin, committing adultery, acting like a Christian. He's not saying that. He is saying to them, because I know whom he was writing and what beliefs he was trying to, to debunk. There were some that said you can be a Christian. And when you became a Christian, God just took out that sin nature. Just like that. You never had any more desire, temptation, propensity, weakness, tendency to sin. Because when you got saved, God surgically removed that. I know they've come a long ways with Lasix, but they don't have that kind. (laughs) 
If we say we have no sin, did you notice what John's saying here? Deception is as bad, if not worse, than lacking assurance. I mean, they say they have no sin. In other words, they're saying, what are you talking about a continual cleansing? Since I've been saved, I lived above sin. I don't have that problem wrestling with the sin. I'll never forget years ago, I need to move on, but uh, my pastor had some folks, we had a lot of these in Oklahoma, visit his house. And they believe, they didn't read First John, but they believe once you got saved, you never ever sinned again because God took out ever ability to sin. Now, He's going to do that one day. He's working on that now. That was Wednesday night. He's working on that. He's sanctifying us. He's helping us take care of that. And one day it's going to be all gone when we're glorified. But this man knocked on my pastor's door and said, I haven't ever sinned since I've been saved. My pastor said, is that right? Meat guy he was. He said, is that right? He said, that's, that's right. I've never sinned since I've been saved. And my pastor looked up and his wife was sitting up in the car. And the pastor said, would you mind if I just went over there and asked your wife a few questions? Oh, he got upset. The guy that never seen lost his temper right there. John said, if you think just because you got saved, you're not going to wrestle with that sinful nature anymore. He said, you deceive yourselves. And the truth is not in us. You see, the fact of the matter is, even though we are saved, we deal with a sinful, lustful flesh. Now, I don't have time to preach all that. Come Wednesday night and get the rest of the story. Because He's given us a means to deal with that. From the Word to the Spirit to the cleansing of the blood. But John said, don't think. Don't say, well, that pastor's preaching about a continual cleansing for Christians, but I don't need that because I don't have that a problem with sin. John said, you're deceiving yourself. What planet were you born on? He was a little more discreet than that. Charles Spurgeon put it this way. He said, The black fingers of sin leave smut marks on our fairest robes. What I'm trying to say is thank God that we do wrestle with that. But thank God there is a blood that can cleanse us. Hallelujah. Don't leave now. You're going to miss the story here, okay? You may think I'm preaching false doctrine. You stick with it here, okay? I'm talking about sins we haven't yet. Oh, I, I, I've got to move on. I just want to ask you this. I'll ask you again on Wednesday night. But how many would have liked it the moment you got saved if God had given you a list of everything that was still wrong with your life that He was going to be working on over the next 20 years? How many would have welcomed that list? Aren't you glad He's kind and He just he just brings it out a little bit at a time? I'm not talking about gross sin. I'm talking about our sinful nature. But assurance we can have, He hasn't brought it all out yet. And until He does, there is a continual cleansing. How many glad there is a fountain filled with blood? Oh, hallelujah. 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 Let's move on. That was the promise of the continual cleansing. But there is the promise of the cleansing at confession. I want you to hear me. Here's the assurance of that cleansing at confession. Look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Aren't you glad for this promise as well? We'll see. We're talking about a little different kind of sin here. But I'm glad for this promise as well. Because it's not just hidden things that I've had the problem with. I, like you, since I've been a believer, there's been those moments of failure. There's been those moments of doing the wrong thing. There's been those moments of letting God down. There's been those moments of sin and transgression. But I'm so glad for this promise that when those moments come, He says if we will confess that wrong, confess that sin, 
He will forgive us of that sin. And He will cleanse us for all unrighteousness. I'm glad the day I got saved and said, Lord, forgive me for this sin. He forgave me then. But I'm glad over the last 46 years, hallelujah, when those moments came that I failed, I'm so glad that at that moment too, I could say, God, I'm sorry. And He forgave and cleansed me then as well. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad there's a cleansing? Hallelujah. That goes beyond even forgiveness. But I want you to notice the condition of this cleansing. If we confess our sin. See, we're talking about two different things. In verse 7, you don't need to show, but in verse 7, it says if we walk in the light, His blood is continually cleansing us from sin. That's unknown sin. That's things God hasn't brought out yet. Those, things, those are things we haven't had opportunity to see our wrong and confess our wrong. But this is a whole different kind of sinning here. You see, the word confess literally comes from roots that means to name them one by one. You know, you can't name a known sin. By definition, you can't do it. You can't name sins. You haven't yet become aware. That, that's, that's the first part of that. That's a continual cleansing. But the moment I realize I've done wrong, the moment the Holy Spirit checks my heart and says, that goes against my will, my word. The moment my conscience strikes me and I said, oh no, I have failed. I have sinned then I no longer can rely upon the continual cleansing. At that moment, I must get to this verse 9 and say, now that I know of it, I can't put my assurance in continual cleansing. Now I know of my wrong. That's a different category. It's time to confess. Wow, we lost the shout somewhere in there. Thank God for the continual cleansing of the unknown, hidden things. But the moment the Spirit brings it, the Word of God surfaces it, then that moves into another category. That sin must be confessed. That sin must be named. That sin must be repented of. That sin must be identified. How many knows that in apologies amongst people we have very genetic, or I shouldn't say genetic, generic, we have very, maybe they are genetic, some of them are passed on, but very generic confessions. If I've offended you, I'm sorry. If I've done something to hurt you, I'm sorry. How many of those people take those generic confessions? To God. God, if I've done anything wrong this week, forgive me. And that's okay if it's an unknown sin. But I'm telling you, if you know what you've done wrong, it's not enough to say, oh God, if I've done anything wrong this week, forgive me. You need to confess it. You need to name it. You need to identify it. And we used to teach our kids, you know, when they get a little spats. Your kids never did that, but ours did two or three times. But, you know, they get a little spat and you want to have them make up and say they're sorry. But you know what they want to do? Just like, I'm sorry. Yours didn't, but I'm sorry. Kind of like you do your spouse. I'm sorry. We'd say, no, you can't do that. You've got to be specific. You look at them and say, will you forgive me for, and then fill in the blank. Will you forgive me for doing this? You know, I believe there'd be great benefit if we'd come to God that way. I mean, just confess. Just say, Lord, forgive me for. And name that thing. I'm talking about getting cleansed. Identify it. You know, you know, there's some people, it's in their nature. They do wrong. And they just want to go on like nothing happened. And that's, that's the way they get over it. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, if you've done wrong with God, you don't just go on like nothing happened. I'll lift my hands, I'll pray, I'll sing, I'll shout. If it's something known, you confess that thing. You identify. You label it. You, I'm talking, you say, that's hard. But no, 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 no. That's the way to victory. Because if we confess our sins, that's when the forgiving starts. 
That's when the cleansing starts. And I don't have time to preach it. But the Bible also says if it's a specific thing that you've done wrong to a person, you'd only go to God and say, God, forgive me for doing it. You go to that individual and you get it right with them. Amen? Now let's say, let's say Brother Mark has been gossiping to Brother Lee about Pastor Hurst. And so Brother Mark says he's getting church, he's feeling real bad. Because Pastor Hurst keeps walking by and putting his hand on him. Say that right, brother? And he gets to feeling really guilty. He's going to want to go, oh, i got to take care of this. God, forgive me for gossiping about the pastor to Brother Lee. Whew, I'm done. No, you're not done. Now, one thing, I, one thing I'm going to get straight. If I don't know you've been gossiping about me, don't come to me. Go to him. He's the one you sinned with and, uh, uh, in gossiping. Say to him, I shouldn't have been gossiping about the pastor. Will you forgive me? Then you get along with God and say, Oh, God, forgive me. I'm sorry. I'll never do it again. He's such a lovely pastor. I'll never do it again. <laughs> See what I'm talking about? Now, like I said, if I don't know anything about it, don't come to me. I had a guy once. I esteemed this man. He's a great minister of God. We was having a great altar service just to pray. And, so, and he came to me and he said, I want to confess I'm jealous of you. And it might have got up off his chest, but it made me feel really bad. What's wrong with me? He got jealous of me. And, and so Brother Mark comes to me. I don't even know about Oh, Pastor Hurst, I've been talking about. What was he saying? Who all did he say it to? How could he think that? You go to the one. Hallelujah. Well, I've already lost the shout. How many knows it's a wonderful promise that if we confess our sin, He will forgive. He will cleanse. But you see, even here, there's not only a condition, there's an omission that we have and do commit specific sins. Look what it says in verse 10. If we say we have not sinned... see. It was have sin. That's the nature. But here, we have not sinned. We've not committed the acts. We make Him a liar. And His Word is not in us. We make Him a liar because the Bible says. The Bible shows we're not yet perfect. Hallelujah. Let's try this. You know, Jesus was unafraid to do this. He just stood up in front of His enemies and said, Which of you convinceth me of sin? Which of you can point out any sins in my life? So if you're here today and you think this Scripture is wrong and you think since you've been saved you haven't committed any sins and you're not going to and that your life is perfect, I would like to invite you to come. We'll stand you up right here and then you can quote Jesus. That's always spiritual. You can quote Jesus and say to this congregation, which of you can point out any sin in my life? How many would be willing to do that? Anybody? Now, if Emma was here, she could lift her hand, okay? Okay? Little Emma. She's too young, see? She's too young to know. We sin. We commit sins worthy of confessing. Now, before you get too far astray, and I'm going to move on to close in a moment. Before you get too far astray, let me remind you of chapter 2. I didn't even give it to Brother Mike. But John said, after saying all this, he said, little children, I have written unto you that you sin not. Just because these things are true, we have a sinful nature and we slip and we fail. It's no excuse to say, thank God I'm saved. I can go ahead and sin. I all want to. The blood of Jesus will take care. No, no. John said, I have written for the purpose not to encourage you to sin. I have written for the purpose to encourage you not to sin. I, these things have I written unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is a perpetuation not for our sin sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In other words, not only does He want to cleanse you, the believer, but He wants to cleanse the sinner that drops by. He wants to cleanse your family members that are lost in sin. Are you glad there's enough the blood to cleanse the converted and the unconverted? Last of all, I want to talk about the faithfulness of the cleanser. Can I do that before we quit? The faithfulness that's why we have assurance from this promise. It's because the one that cleanses, he's faithful. 
Hallelujah. You see, this whole promise hinges on this. Let's see verse 9. This whole promise hinges on this. If we confess our sins, He is faithful. Isn't that enough to be assured? Hallelujah. How many feels assurance in that? He is faithful. When you've sinned and I've sinned, we've done wrong and we begin to confess. We don't say, I know I'm cleansed because I feel like it. The feeling may come. We don't say, I know I'm cleansed because, uh, you know, I deserve it. Or I'm cleansed because I claim that as my right as a believer. You know what we say? I know I'm cleansed. It does, it's not based on who I am. Whether I'm cleansed or not isn't based on what I've done or haven't done. Whether I'm cleansed or not is based on His faithfulness. He's faithful. You know, we, we, we get to that point. Devil likes to do it. We know that God forgave us and we got saved. But here we are again. We've blown it. And so we get down and say, Lord, forgive me. And you know what the devil will tell you? He won't forgive you this time. How many ever had Satan tell you that? He won't forgive you that this time. Wait a minute, devil. I'm confessing. I'm sincere. I'm in earnest. And so it's not up to me whether or not I'm forgiven. It's not based on what I have done or haven't done. It's not based on how good. It's based on the fact that He is faithful. Oh, God. Aren't you glad that He is? I, I want to ask you. I, mean, I'm, I want you to really, according to God's Word, how many has ever sincerely, earnestly, honestly come to the Lord and He said to you, this time I'm not forgiving you. For that, I'm not cleansing you. Has it ever happened? Has it ever happened that He said this this time, I'm not. It's never happened, Brother Wilson. Even in your long walk with the Lord, even because every time we come sincerely with our faith in Him, Amen, and call out to Him every time, He cleanses us. Why? Because He's faithful. Hallelujah. He does not lie. He is faithful. And so the message today. We should not have presumption come music. We cannot say, I'll go ahead and sin because He promised He would forgive and cleanse sin. We don't say that. We say, I don't want to sin. I'm seeking to let God move in my life to live above sin. But I am so grateful that if I do sin, He promised He would forgive and cleanse. I write that you sin not. But if you do, we have an advocate with the Father. I believe God wants us to have both the assurance, but He also wants us to have the quickness to confess and repent. And in that we can live. How oh, high. Some of you remember back in November 26 of 2008, those terrorists in India went into the Taj Mahal Palace and killed over 200 people that were in that, that lobby there in, in that, or in that building there. You may remember that incident. They thought they had killed every person in this dining room. They went in there and just started blazing away with their guns and just slaughtering everywhere. One man was interviewed by a reporter as they were get, trying to look for survivors and they found him and they were getting him out of the building and the reporter interviewed him. The man was totally covered with blood. And the reporter said, How did you survive? He said, well, I was sitting at the table with three others. And all of a sudden we heard gunshots and one of my friends grabbed me and threw me under the table. And he said, they came by shooting and checking everyone. But he said, I was so covered with the blood of one of my friends that died. I lay still and I was so covered with his blood that when they came by to kill me, they thought I was already dead. And because of my friend's blood, I'm alive. That's us. Because we're covered with His blood, we're alive. Hallelujah. And the gunman of Satan, he's not able to touch because we're covered with His blood. How many glad for the promise?
of the cleansing. Let's stand and worship Him across the earth. Why don't you just lift up your hands. If you've ever needed the blood, would you praise Him? If you've ever needed the cleansing, would you praise Him? If you've ever needed forgiveness, would you praise Him? Hallelujah. Maybe right now while you're here, amen, you could ask the Lord to forgive you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Cleanse my heart. Purify my mind. I'm really sorry, God, for doing that thing. I identify that thing in Your presence. I call it by its name. I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry, Lord. I shouldn't have watched that. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have partaken. Would You forgive me, Lord, and help me to walk in the light as You are in the light that I may have the continual cleansing day by day, hour by hour. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to pause this morning if you're here and you're not converted. John said the blood's not only for the believer, but it's for the whole world. And you're here this morning. You're tired of sin. You're tired of the guilt. You're tired of the condemnation. You're tired of a life of darkness. I want to invite you to come this morning. And the Bible says if you'll call out to the Lord, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. You shed your blood for my sins and confess your sins. Oh, He'd forgive you. How many can testify it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to feel the weight of sin gone. To know you're forgiven and cleansed. And again, not just covered up by His blood, but removed. Removed by His blood. Oh, how many remembers when your sins were removed? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're here. You're not a believer. You'd like to be washed this morning. Would you come right now? Hallelujah. I need Jesus. I need a washing. Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner clean. Yes, I know. I surely know. Oh, come you sinners lost and hopeless. Jesus' blood can make you clean. Hallelujah. Maybe you'd like to begin to fill the altars. Maybe you're even a believer, but there's something you'd like to confess to God. You'd like to come and say, God, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have. I'm sorry. I knew better. Lord, I'm sorry. Your Spirit's talking to me. I'm sorry. Your Word has touched me, Lord. And oh God, right now I confess that thing that you might cleanse it. Are you here? You like to fill these altars and say, Lord, I've come one more time to confess and to repent and to call out to you. Are you here? Would you come right now? Hallelujah. As we wait. I'm talking about believers now. If we, if we, we believers, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. Hallelujah. That stays open. Amen. I'm open it for this. You've lost the assurance. The devil's badgered you. you badgered yourself. You went over the same sins over and over and over and over again. You need the assurance that if you're walking in the light, there is a continual flow that is washing, 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 cleansing your heart. If you need assurance this morning, I want you to begin to move into these altars. Hallelujah. Anyone in the building, you want salvation, you want assurance, you want to confess. Hallelujah. Would you come? Make that step of faith. Make that step of faith. Lord, I'm thinking, I'm coming thanking you. I'm thanking you for your blood. I'm thanking you for the cleansing. I'm glad the blood will never lose its power. It reaches to the highest mountain. It reaches to the darkness valley. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, blessed be the name of God. Blessed be the name of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why don't you call out to Him this morning? Doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, Jesus blood to wash away the vows. Nothing but the blood.
Somebody's experiencing it right now. Somebody's saying, Lord, I'm sorry. And the Lord's cleansing them, washing them, purifying them. Hallelujah. Nothing but the blood. Why don't you thank Him for it this morning? Hallelujah. God is faithful. God is faithful. To say God can't cleanse you is to say God's not faithful. God's faithful. Thank you for the flow. Thank you for the wash.